podcast. The uh, Resolution Foundation. Uh, we're delighted that this week we are hosting uh, four events linked to the four grand challenges uh, identified in the government's industrial strategy. Uh, and the timing has worked out brilliantly. Today is also the day that the Prime Minister herself is giving a major speech on industrial strategy, and uh, that's very relevant background to what we are talking about. Uh, and these events will be involve participation, not just of experts, and there's a fantastic group of experts here in the room today. We're delighted that we're joined as well by key ministers responsible for these <coughs> challenges. So it's marvellous that today for our first event uh, on mobility, we're joined by Jesse Norman, the Parliamentary Undersecretary of State for Transport. And of course, Jesse, as well as now being the minister, absolutely in, with key responsibility for these technological advances in mobility. Before that was the minister working on industrial strategy in Bayes. So he's, it's great that he's coming along to give the first speech of this whole series of events. He's the right guy to set the scene. We're then going to hear from George Hazel of Mobility as a Service in Scotland. We're going to hear from Lucy Yu of 5AI. And we're going to hear from Toby Poston of DV, BVRLA, the, the Vehicle Rental and Leasing Association. Uh, and then there should be ample time for you to comment and question because, of course, this is the right moment uh, to have this kind of discussion. Uh, the programmes are still being designed. The uh, allocation of the funding is still underway. So Jesse has already assured us upstairs in the green room that he really is in listening mode. And perhaps I can just end with a couple of other observations on the way these events are going. What is special about these events is that whereas historically industrial strategy has belonged to one department, the business department, and we would have had uh, representation solely from that department, uh, in reality, to make these things happen, it can't be done by that department on its own. Uh, there are a range of other departments involved. Uh, and it's great that we can see the Department of Transport taking the lead in all this and working closely uh, with Bayes as part of the wider industrial strategy. That's great. Uh, and speaking as a former science minister, one of the other things that we used to find frustrating was that so much of the budget for R&D has ended up in the science budget because other budgets, departmental R&D budgets, were being cut. Um, the original idea uh, had, over the decades, when the model of science funding in Britain was being constructed was that there would be a science budget with the Haldane principle and uh, driving uh, driven above all by scientific excellence. But alongside it, there would be departmental R&D budgets funding applied research to help deliver the policy priorities of the individual departments. And what we now see in the Department of Transport with substantial funds they've got for these initiatives is once more a partnership between uh, the science uh, funding side and departmental R&D. And the other transformation in attitudes, and the Department of Transport is a conspicuous example of this, is that in the old days, 
technology used to be taken as fixed over the lifetime of any given policy problem. People didn't think technolo technological change was relevant for solving the problem. Now there's been a very significant change in culture and technology and what technology can contribute to today's problems is very much on the agenda. And all those, all those issues, all those very welcome tendencies are very clearly displayed in the Department of Transport. I know that's in no small part due to the arrival of Jesse there. It's great that Jesse has joined us today and let me hand over to him to give the opening speech. Jesse, you're very welcome. Well, David, thank you very much indeed. And thank you, ladies and gentlemen, um, for coming along. And thanks to the Resolution Foundation um, for hosting this event. Uh, I must say, David said, when you're thinking about coming downstairs, you need to think of it as being rather like the Curzon Street cinema. And my mind went back to the many films I'd seen and the extraordinary efforts I'd had to make not to just sink back into the marvellous armchairs and drift softly off to sleep. Um, and I think that's a typically ingenious Resolution Foundation method for making absolutely certain that the speakers are really on their toes and hopefully as interesting as possible. Um, and I'm certainly going to try to do that if I possibly can. I can't really escape, um, as David's mentioned, having been Minister for Industrial Strategy um, uh, and also Energy Minister at Bayes. And those are the three elements that really come together with transport in thinking about this whole question of mobility uh, as a service and the future of mobility more widely. And uh, I'm going to be talking about all those uh, themes. When I was at Bayes, my standard line was that, um, it, you know, the countries that didn't think they had an industrial strategy had one without knowing it. Uh, and I think one of the great merits of having an industrial strategy, and here I absolutely doff my cap and pay tribute to David's role in getting this whole line of thought really moving and embedded within government. One of the advantages of having an industrial strategy is precisely that hopefully we can be explicit about what hills we're trying to plant, what flags in and who's going to do it and how we all work as a team uh, and achieve that. Um, so let me then uh, set the scene, if I may, and discuss a little bit an issue that I think has absolutely profound implications for the way uh, our economy, but of course not just our economy, but our society is going to evolve over the next uh, few decades. And that is, of course, uh, the future of mobility. Now, I, I think it's become a cliche that we're on the verge of a transport revolution, but I hope I can just give you a, some sense as to how one might think of that uh, in a way that puts some more flesh on the bones. Um, when I look back uh, in my own lifetime at the way in which transport has evolved, uh, I have been struck. I mean, in, indeed, I put it to you, it's astonishing how little transport uh, has evolved. And that's not just because, um, you know, I was a child bride. I mean, it, genuinely, over the last 20 or 30 years, there's been, in many ways, remarkably little change. We still remain utterly wedded to our cars. Um, they are still largely, almost entirely powered by internal combustion engines. Um, our railway network is extremely similar to the one it was um, uh, only a few decades ago. Um, the number of people travelling on, of course, has massively improved and increased, and the amount of services offered on it has increased, but um, the scale of the network um, uh, is no, no greater. Um, we're using the same bus routes in many cases for the majority of our local uh, journeys, and of course, we're still flying to the Med uh, on holiday in just the way we used to, and in many cases on 737s, an aeroplane whose first commercial flight was in 1968. So I think in many ways, not much uh, has uh, changed. Um, even if you go beyond that, look at general aviation and the way in which uh, um, you know, light aircraft are designed, that has not evolved much over the last few years. And when it did evolve originally, it was in reaction, it was trying to make aeroplanes more like cars, which is why you had a yoke rather than a joystick and all the other events uh, uh, and ways of flying that you see today. Now, what could be a bigger comparison than the changes that our children, our children's children are going to see over the next few decades, um, where I think they will be seeing things that would have seemed like science fiction only very recently. Um, so cars and ships that are operating autonomously, drones that deliver goods to people's houses uh, by air or on the ground, um, electric vehicles that recharge on the move so that there's going to be delays to journeys. Um, science fiction is becoming science fact. And that moment of change, that inflection point, is what makes this particular moment extraordinarily uh, interesting. And of course, with change um, comes great responsibility, but of course also comes great opportunity. So um, 
What does that mean for the UK? Well, I think it's, we've said on many occasions, we want to be a world leader in this area. We want to be a world leader in the way that people, goods and services move around. And we want to do that by developing not just technology, but practical know-how, skills embedded in um, society and in our industrial supply chains and uh, places of expertise that allow us to not merely build a better future here, but to export that around the world. And that is why um, the future mobility is one of our so-called grand uh, challenges within the industrial strategy. And of course, what it means is we have to rethink everything, not just, uh, as it were, from the point of view of uh, the passenger experience, but also from the point of view of businesses, uh, and of course, from the point of view of public policy. And I think it raises some pretty profound uh, philosophical questions. Um, I mean, I would do, um, having been a philosopher at one point in my own life, but, you know, what is the public good um, which is at stake here? How is it being used? How should it most appropriately be charged for, if at all? How should it be regulated? These are, in, in some cases, philosophical questions. What trade-offs should be used? Um, and we don't just, we can't just focus on different modes of transport. We have to think about it in a much more, a much newer and more integrated way uh, if we're going to be uh, successful. Uh, we have to think about journey planning. We have to think about how these modes coexist. We have to think about payment systems. Uh, things that um, historically might have seemed highly unconnected need to come together. Mobility must be accessible for everyone. Now, uh, it won't surprise you that we've already begun this process. We're thinking very hard about these issues already. Let me just give you a few examples. Um, first of all, is about investment, think about preparing for the future. And um, from a public investment standpoint, we've already committed £250 million up to 2021 to support the development of autonomous self-driving vehicles. And we're expecting to work with something like 200 companies and 70 collaborative projects uh, uh, and research institutions um, uh, in, it, in order to make that uh, a reality. Uh, we're, we're very ambitious for the UK to lead the world in uh, electric vehicle technology in use. Um, we've said almost every car and van on our roads must be zero emission by 2050, and we're investing something like one and a half billion pounds between 2015 and 2021 in order to support one of those comprehensive programs of support for uh, ultra low emission vehicles anywhere in the world, and that includes grants for plug-in vehicles, cars, vans, lorries, buses, taxis, and motorcycles. I'm not going to say e-cargo bikes or e-bikes yet, um, but that's something that I'm certainly thinking about. And schemes to support charge point infrastructure uh, at homes, workplaces, and on residential streets, and of course the 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 delivery. Um, of mobility is going to require the delivery of adequate amounts of electricity to those charge points if we're going to have a really resilient, robust system. Now, at the end of this year, we'll be publishing uh, a mobility future of urban mobility strategy. But I want to be clear that I personally and the department takes rural mobility no less seriously. There's tremendous opportunity in this area to create a paradigm shift in the way in which people in rural areas can uh, uh, use transport. Uh, and I think that's um, at least as interesting in many ways when one thinks of isolation uh, in society as many of the more obvious opportunities in cities. Um, but that urban mobility strategy will set out some of the principles we're going to be applying to keep our urban mobility program focused and on track. We have a call for evidence. Uh, which is still open, and we would absolutely welcome your input, ladies and gentlemen, in giving us your ideas, your feedback, evidence you've come across, uh, things we should be thinking about. And of course, we're also investing in the UK's own workforce uh, in order to create the skills and expertise to achieve that ambition. Um, and as you know, we're in the uh, year of engineering at the moment, 2018. I can't talk about this without thinking about um, this pioneering initiative in higher education in my own county, the New Model in Technology and Engineering, which David has been such a supporter of and we're so grateful for that. That's charging ahead different ways of thinking about how you teach people um, collaboratively without teaching so much as collective solving of problems. Um, and I think using the best experience of higher education from around the world to inform the next generation of teaching in this country. So we've got an enormous amount uh, going on. We're also trying to encourage investors and technology developers to come to this country. And that means trying to provide one of the most open regulatory environments that we can for innovation in transport and in transport services. Our code of practice for testing automated vehicles on public roads is evidence of that. The uh, automotive, uh, Automated and Electric Vehicles Bill um, will enable drivers of automated cars to be insured on our UK roads and increase the accessibility and availability of charge points. Um, so this future mobility strategy that I'm talking about is not just going to address the way that technology is developed, it's also going to prepare our country for the way in which we use transport. And we'll be hearing a bit later on about mobility 
as a service, I think it's an extremely interesting uh, approach, thinking of bringing the different modes of transport together, thinking of merging functions like customer information and payment into single uh, integrated system. Uh, and I don't know if you've noticed it yet, but we have this mobility platform already working, operating, getting going in Birmingham called WIM. Um, and uh, that is designed to give users information, access to different services, buses, trams, taxis, um, but many other extensions as well. So the potential is enormous. Uh, and if we're successful in it, we can make transport networks more efficient, but far more accessible, more inclusive, uh, and uh, uh, much more uh, beneficial to businesses and individuals. Um, that is what we're seeking to do in the Future of Ability Grand Challenge. Um, and of course, part of that is a review of our own transport legislation. We don't want that to inhibit the growth, we wanted to enable the growth. People forget that legislation can often enable growth as well as inhibiting it, and we wanted to do that. We want to be cleverer about how people share transport data and how they use it, and that's going to involve, uh, uh, potentially involves rethinking our regulation. Uh, we want open and fair competition. As you know, when you have technology, you have the capacity to level playing fields. You also have the capacity to privilege insiders over outsiders, and it's important that that balance uh, is struck and that we make sure that our businesses are operating as competitive a market as, uh, as possible. Uh, so in September of last year, we commissioned a study into big data and the Internet of Things to try to understand those issues better and to highlight barriers to sharing data across different transport services. All of that will inform regulation and help us to uh, manage and develop this way of thinking, enhance services and help passengers make better decisions. You will have detected from my enthusiasm today my overall wider excitement of the prospects that sit before us, uh, ladies and gentlemen, um, the opportunities that will be offered to cut emissions, to improve safety, to tackle congestion, and to make our journeys more reliable and better for passengers in every way. Uh, I think it's potentially something that is as revolutionary in its own way as any of the changes we saw in the 19th century. And I think if it, we get it right within government, we can make it extremely successful, not just for people, but for businesses and for society as a whole. Thank you very much indeed. George Hazel of Mobility as a Service in Scotland. David, thank you very much. Good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. It's a privilege to be here. And Minister, thank you for your words as well. It's very encouraging to hear the kind of things that you've been saying. Uh, my background, originally a civil engineer, and I've been in transport policy and planning for uh, a good number of years in the public and private sector. But I've never seen, I've seen lots of changes, but I've never seen anything like what's been happening. I've been tracking this since 2006. Um, the original work I did when I worked for a consultancy was the complete mobility for Siemens, the kind of stuff you'll see in the Crystal, if you've been to the Crystal in the Docklands here in London. And, and out of that came a thing called the transport retail model. Um, and out of that, uh, we are where we are with mobility as a service. And the, the thing to realise with what's happening in the mobility market, it's not actually being driven largely by transport or even mobility. Um, it's been, first of all, driven by global trends, uh, things like uh, personalisation of services, and you can see that across the board, not just in mobility, uh, which in turn is being driven by complexity of lifestyle. And it's also being driven by technology. Uh, a number of years ago, not, probably not that far away, the, the concept of every one of us having a personal mobility plan was just fairyland, but it's not now. And in fact, it's happening through things like WIM. Uh, technology can deliver that. And, and so it's, it's turning the model I've been used to on its head, uh, rather than an operational model starting from a strategic plan and working down, which you still need, by the way. Uh, mobility as a service and future mobility is actually starting with the customer, both business and personal, and working up in a co-design way with, with, the, with the passenger, with the user, and indeed with non-users, to provide a mobility service for the future, including the incentivized model and all of that kind of stuff that goes with it. That's the power of, of mass. Um, the mode stuff that I've spent a lot of my life uh, arguing about, bus and rail and cycle and whatever, kind of goes out the door. It's about door-to-door -door seamless service. It's about what, what, oops, it's about what I want uh, and I need, given my options, and my options might be sustainable or, or, or it might be fit, fa fastest or quickest or, or, or cheapest. Um, and so the basis of, of wh where that's coming from, and it's all about value as well, is very different. And so 
four years ago, um, the Scottish government and the Scottish enterprise said, we've got to look at this. So I, I did a report uh, over three years, and then that led to the formation a year ago of, of Mass Scotland, um, based uh, really in industry, but uh, partnering with the public sector. There are now 67 uh, members, fee-paying members, about 50-odd, 50 55 are private sector, from SMEs to uh, very large uh, companies. Uh, all the regional uh, 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 transport authorities, and indeed we're partnering with a whole load of people across the, the, the UK and, and Europe. The key thing, and, and Minister, you mentioned it, is, is there's so many questions about mass. We, we now need to get to the stage of, of answering these questions for real. And so the nine projects we're working on, two of them are up and running. One, Navigogo, if you want to have a look at that, is for mobility packages between 16 and 25-year-olds, co-designed with us by 16, 25-year-olds. It's very exciting, funded by Innovate uh, UK. But we're also looking at two remote islands, we're, we're looking at a national park, we're looking at rural areas, semi-small cities, and of course the two big cities, uh, Glasgow and Edinburgh. And, and asking the, just the questions you asked, where does it work? What's the commercial model in all of this? And I suppose that's the key stage that we're at just now. When you look at what Finland have done and Sweden and now Netherlands government are doing, industry is willing to invest. Or some of our companies have said, yeah, we're willing to bring some big money to the table, but they're nervous. It's high risk. It's an emerging market. And, and somehow they want the comfort of government to say, look, we're willing, we think this is really important, we're willing to partner with industry and push this forward in some sort of framework. And I think the whole challenge front framework is absolutely the right way to go. So I think it's a really exciting time and I'm, I'm looking forward to hearing comments from the floor as well. It's a very knowledgeable and uh, widespread uh, audience in terms of experience. So I think we're going to have a, a good debate. David, thank you. Very thank much, you. George. Uh, now let's hear from Lucy Yu, who is at 5AI. Well, thank you, David. Um, I, I'm not going to talk for long, um, but I, I hope uh, you've got some interesting questions when we've finished. Um, I'm just going to start with a few numbers. Okay. And um, those of you who are in the autonomous vehicles industry, I'm, I'm sure, uh, will be familiar with some of these. Um, so firstly, uh, 1.2 million. Um, that's the number of people who are killed on our roads globally um, every year. Um, many, many more um, also seriously injured, sometimes life-changing injuries. Um, the second number is, is 94%. Um, now, this number will be familiar to some of you. This, if you own a private car, on average, it will spend 94% of its time parked and 6% of its time actually um, moving around, taking you on your trips or actually on useful journeys. So if you think about all of the land that's currently used for just, just for parking and sometimes prime land in our city centres, land that could actually be returned to the public realm and, and, and used to make nicer public places, public spaces. Um, so in the cities, um, I, I, I just find it so ironic. There are many, uh, many streets where you will have effectively two lanes, um, one at each side of the street dedicated to parking. And that will leave just one lane in the middle of the street that's actually useful for, for moving traffic. Um, and then finally, um, 30 to 60 percent, um, that's the typical cost of a, of a journey uh, made using something like taxi or private hire, um, which is the cost of the driver for that trip. So at 5AI, we are developing autonomous vehicles um, and we want to use those vehicles to deliver low cost, accessible um, urban mobility for everybody. So uh, we think that at its maturity, this technology can be far safer um, than, than human drivers. We can remove the need for all of that land to be used for parking. We can flip that 94% and 6% on its head um, and we can make 94% or 95%, even higher percentages of, 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 of time, useful time that our vehicles uh, are, are moving and transporting people. Um, and by um, reducing the overall cost of the system, we can make much more af affordable journeys for people. So people who um, may currently have, uh, for instance, first and last mile difficulties or, or may not have um, good public transport provision where they are, we can start to infill um, some of those gaps. So our model is very much a service model. George has talked about mobility as a service. Um, we don't intend to sell our vehicles. We think in the future we'll see much more of a shift from people owning their own private vehicles towards actually consuming transportation as a service. Um, now, we are very clear that we don't want to compete with public transport. Um, 
We will be uh, developing mobility for cities. Our first city, our demonstration city, is going to be London, so right here. Um, we intend to operate those pilot services in early 2020. Uh, we're working very closely with Transport for London and the London boroughs to identify the precise routes, the precise areas that will run those services. Um, we are focused on complementing existing public transport, so that may be pushing people on first and last mile trips to and from existing public transport hubs, um, but also trying to identify areas where there are um, many kind of private commuter car journeys made um, and then attempting to provide a, a viable and a really convenient shared service that can fill in for those trips um, so by doing so we can reduce the number of vehicles on the roads um, so that's our kind of model in a nutshell we think this is a significant global market some of the research out there suggests as much as a 400 billion pound uh, global market within the next sort of 10 to 15 years um, we're really pleased um, that we have such a kind of open regulatory environment for, for testing and trialling automated vehicle technologies in the UK. It's massively uh, attractive to companies like 5AI. We also have a huge amount of talent in the UK for the core engineering, the core technologies that you need to assemble these kinds of products. So computer vision, machine learning, mapping, mapping and localization, simulation, all of these technologies you need to build a, a, an autonomous driving stack. So we have that talent, we have the uh, possibility to assemble that talent. What we do know is it's going to take a lot of investment to get to the point where we have a commercially sustainable um, uh, business. Um, so we need a really large kind of shot in the arm to, to get to that point. It's fantastic, we're getting support from the, from the government, so thank you Jesse and, and your team um, from the industrial strategy. Um, We'd love to see a lot more of that. One of the things that we don't perhaps have in the UK that does exist in, in the US and China is this concept of sort of mega venture. Um, so very, very significant uh, venture capital funding. Um, we'd love to see government um, help to kind of address that gap in the market, if you like, to, to really ensure that the, the biggest companies in this space, um, companies like 5AI, can become global prospects and can become leaders in this space. And that, um, we don't uh, concede that market to the likes of uh, Google and Apple and some of the other um, larger American or Chinese companies. So we think there's a significant opportunity there. We definitely have the talent. Uh, we just, just need that um, ability to get the escape velocity uh, we need there. Um, so I guess final comments. Um, I've talked a lot about passenger transportation. Um, I think there's also um, just huge scope for disruption um, <coughs> from the use of robotics and automation in other types of mobility as well. Um, I was recently um, recently at a meeting um, with a, I won't name them, but I think probably one of the largest um, UK supermarket uh, online brands, beginning with an O. Yeah. Um, I got to have a look at their uh, robotics and automation technology for picking your order when you place an order online and delivering it to, to your door. And in fact, actually, they have optimised that system um, so fantastically, so brilliantly that actually... If, if you order your groceries using um, using that online service, it actually has a lower carbon footprint than if you were to walk to your supermarket, buy your shopping and walk back home again. Um, so there's some real fantastic um, possibilities coming along and I'm really excited to hear more and to hear some of your questions as well. Thank you. Good. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Lucy. And finally, let's hear from Toby Poston of the BVRLA. Thank you, David. Um, yes, yeah, so I'm here really to um, give you a bit of a fleet perspective on how um, owners and operators of uh, millions of vehicles across the UK are getting to grips with this, this mobility challenge. More specifically, um, I work for the BVRA, which represents the vehicle rental and leasing sector. So our members include companies like Hertz, Avis, Zipcar, DriveNow, um, organisations like that. So they're, they're probably brands you're aware of, but actually you're probably not maybe aware of just how much and how integral they are to the to the way we, uh, we move people and goods around the UK. You probably didn't travel by road here today, but any, any decent sized road, road journey you make in the UK, you're gonna pass um, hundreds if not thousands of their vehicles every day. So these guys obviously have a very, very big stake in, uh, in this whole area. Um, to put it in context, our members own and operate about five million vehicles. That's one in every eight cars, one in every five vans, and one in every five trucks that operate on UK roads. Um, they're already um, playing a key role in this area. Um, and this profound change we talk about in terms of uh, future mobility, these people, it's really gonna hit them smack in the face when it happens. And they're already getting to grips with it. They're very excited. They're also very nervous um, about the impact it's having. 
Um, as you'd expect already, they already buy um, roughly half of all new vehicles sold in the UK each year. So they're investing heavily in new technology, they're recruiting, um, looking for new skill sets, they're developing partnerships and collaboration in areas they never believed they would be working in before. Um, and they're also um, spending lots of money on expensive management consultants. Um, the BVLA itself has been uh, looking at this area now for four or five years. We have a regular fleet technology event. We've invested lots in research and white papers. We also participate in lots of government and industry working groups. So rather than look into the future and try and give you a, a perspective on how the, uh, the impact of this technology is going to have, I'm going to focus on some of the um, here and now perspective that our members are providing us as they try and get to grips with this area. Um, I've only got a few minutes. So I'm going to try and sum up some of the, the feedback we're getting from them in the areas of connected, electric and intelligent mobility. Firstly, I just want to sum up what I'm about to say in sort of a broad context, which is that we've heard a lot about the, within the industrial strategy, about the need for a flexible regulatory framework that supports innovation and free competition. Now, none of our members would argue with that. That's a really noble, noble sentiment. Um, but I would argue that our regulatory and policy environment needs a little bit of innovation um, too. The future mobility challenge should not just be about new technology, infrastructure and business models. I think the UK can really set the pace um, by creating a regulatory and a fiscal environment that really supports all these changes that need to happen. So three examples I think of where we could um, really make a difference. The first one is in the area of data. Um, it's, it's really true to say now that um, data is, is really the new currency in the automotive world. Um, and we believe that regulators really need to act now to get to grips and avoid a situation where we end up um, with any danger of anti-competitive behaviour um, that emerges as certain policies parties look to control access to vehicle data. Our members have joined forces with a broad coalition uh, within Europe that represents insurers, um, garages, parts manufacturers, um, even motoring organisations to try and call for fair and competitive access to vehicle data and the resources within cars. Without it, there's a real danger that in the coming years, consumers are going to have less choice in where they get their vehicles, um, where they rent vehicles, where they get them repaired, and how they get them insured. The second area I want to talk about is electric vehicles. Um, I think my members would argue that electric vehicles are a more imminent and important policy um, priority than autonomous vehicles, especially with the air quality issues that we see in the papers every day. Um, our members are already leading the way in adopting electric vehicles. We've got members with electric car club vehicles on the streets outside and our members are also about 6% of new car registrations each year that they're registering are going into are electric and are going into businesses uh, and with consumers up and down the country. But this could happen a lot, lot faster. Um, policymakers can help in two areas, two areas I'd like to highlight here. Firstly, um, we'd like a revamp of the company car tax and the vehicle excise duty regime because at the moment they are acting as a disincentive for people to choose electric cars over non-electric counterparts. Secondly, we'd like the government to help by continuing to look at ways of streamlining the planning process for people wanting to install charging and for looking um, to support efforts to reinforce the, the power grid. The final area I want to talk about is this exciting area of, of mobility services. Lots of our members are involved in trials with WIM in cities like Manchester, in Birmingham, um, and are very interested in the, in the prospect um, of looking to develop uh, either smart card or smartphone based uh, solutions. But they're nervous about this, how this sector is going to evolve. They're worried about losing their brand um, identity, they're worried about losing that direct relationship with customers, and they don't want to become one of these faceless, commoditized um, transport providers that's feeding into some mass global uh, technology platform that is owned and managed by people in, uh, in uh, Silicon Valley. So as the boundaries between public and private transport merge, um, we think it's essential that local authorities in particular um, are given the support and resources they need to get to grips with this and what it means for their local transport environment and ensure that these platforms can be integrated with what they're trying to do on the ground. This is the, this is the only way we're going to make sure that these new technology platforms and mass really gets to grips with issues like air quality, congestion and road safety. In summary, I'd just like to say that we're delighted that um, Future mobility is, is part of the industrial strategy and indeed one of the pillars. Um, we really feel that the UK is a bit of a crossroads uh, when it comes to becoming a world leader in this area. And if we get to grips with some of these issues I've just outlined, I'm really confident that we'll be looking back in a very short space of time and saying what a success we've made of it. Thank you. Right, well, that's, uh, that's excellent. We, we aim to 
end promptly at two o'clock, so we have 25 minutes. And this is your opportunity. Chip in with thoughts. You are entitled to shameless pushing of your own particular company or uh, area of interest. Uh, do it briskly and briefly. And as well as that, sometimes the problem with industrial strategies is that they can be a kind of brand tub of goodies, whereas actually you need some kind of framework, some kind of sense of a structure of what the priorities are and how they've emerged. And of course, the government in the uh, original document identified for mobility four particular early priorities, which was the regulatory regime. It was uh, zero, moving to zero emission vehicles. And it's interesting, of course, Jessie has talked about regulation and the PM uh, in her speech is talking about zero emission vehicles. And then uh, services proposed, making it easier to create new mobility services and access and uses of data. So those were the government's kind of four immediate priorities within this challenge. It'd be interesting to know if people agree with those and if there are others they would add and how we would judge the priorities that we could set particular proposals against others. So let us now hear from the audience. Let's start with those two people in the back there. We've got two roving mics. We'll start there. Yeah, and if you could give your name and organisation, that would be fantastic. Hello, I'm Helen Jones from the Science Museum Group. Um, and my point is about public um, engagement and participation in, with the industrial strategy, because of course the public are there as consumers, as workers, as the innovators and researchers of the future. So in the Science Museum Group, we have massive audiences. We have huge reach right across the UK. We have massive experience in public engagement. Um, and my question is, how can the stakeholders in this room help us to deploy these assets in um, delivering and implementing the industrial strategy. For example, the National Railway Museum is undergoing a major redevelopment with much more focus on today's and tomorrow's railway. In the short term, our next um, contemporary science exhibition is about aut autonomous vehicles. How can we uh, make the most of these opportunities in an integrated and genuinely useful way to all stakeholders? Thanks. Fantastic pitch. I should say I'm a trustee of the Science Museum, so I thought that was a particularly <laughs> astute intervention. Is right. everyone here an institutional Victorian <laughs> trustee? Just, just to be clear. Quite a few, yes. <laughs> Don't that. Uh, yeah, Jake Sumner from Field Consulting. Um, I just wanted to ask about the, the charging points that was touched on and how you see the framework or the mechanisms uh, to scale that in a quick way uh, and particularly sort of vis-a-vis -vis the industrial strategy, um, <coughs> we saw the rollout of, elect uh, of uh, smart meters uh, I don't know, uh, have somewhat challenges with the rollout of that, you know, in the second generation and not being interchangeable before, et cetera, et cetera. So how, how do you see it uh, with local authorities? How do you see it with the government? How do you see it with the private sector? Uh, and the best way of creating a framework, I suppose, right. for action. Right, very good. We're going to collect that as well. Then down here, yes, Eddie Hi. here. Uh, Rachel Miller from the Social Mobility Commission. Um, last year we identified a number of social mobility cold spots, uh, largely in rural and coastal areas. Jesse, you mentioned rural mobility briefly, um, but given that lack of connectivity, both road networks and public transport provision is um, an issue for people getting to jobs and other services like colleges, what is the government doing to address that? And I suppose thoughts from the other panellists as well about how we can um, quickly address lack of rural mobility. Right, great. And then the gentleman behind you. And I think after this, I'm going to pause to invite the panellists to comment because we're collecting a series of rather specific points. Then we'll go back to the audience. Yeah. Hi, I'm Callum Thorner from Airbus. I would just like to point out that uh, many people flying to the Med also do so on the uh, A320 and other products. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Uh, my question, I think, would mostly face to the Minister. Um, when you discussed the sort of where you think we're going to be going with uh, urban mobility, I did notice that you didn't mention anything uh, urban air mobility, um, sort of electric uh, air-based transport systems and the required sort of uh, hubs for getting on board, landing, and sort of uh, those sorts of principles. So I was wondering uh, what your thoughts were on, on that aspect of future mobility in an urban space. Right. Jesse, there's several of those. Yes. Uh, well, vast numbers of good questions there. Thank you very much indeed. Mm -hmm. uh, in relation to the last one, Airbus A320, listen, if you would like me to refer to the Airbus A320 as an example of an ancient technology still in use, I'm delighted mm -hmm. to do that. <laughs> that was the point I was making about the 737. That was the point I was making about the 737. Mm -hmm. um, uh, electric air-based transport systems, um, 
uh, uh, I, my view is simple. It's, 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 you know, show me. I'm interested to see more evidence of the deployability timetables of that. We're obviously doing a lot of thinking about how to use um, airspace intelligently in many different ways. We're thinking about digital airspace, we're thinking about the space bill, if you go all the way up. But near-Earth airspace, of course, is of, uh, is of great interest to us. Um, uh, but, you know, I'd like to know more, and I, don't, I certainly don't feel that it's yet achieved critical mass in terms of the place it could be in our future policy thinking. Um, very quickly, on uh, Rachel's point about social mobility, well, of course, that's absolutely right. Um, uh, the government's keenly aware of this, so what's, let's just look at some of the stuff that's happening. First of all, you have um, kind of investment support we've put behind rural broadband over the last five years. That's been an enormous enhancement to social mobility. Um, certainly in my, in my area of Herefordshire, I'm um, just to take a remote place, probably the hardest place to uh, uh, hook up anywhere in the country because of the way in which houses, houses are dispersed. Um, you know, we have GigaClear about to you know, get mo mo moving, and that means we'll have to be with one gigabit of... Uh, um, of connectivity. That's astonishing, unimaginable, and that will itself do an enormous amount. Um, uh, we have the major roads network coming out through the new RIS2 funding uh, uh, package that will be uh, running from 2020 to 2025. That's an, an attempt to boost investment in local roads and interconnectivity with the regions. Uh, and of course we have all the stuff we're talking about, I've talked about, in terms of building a cultural, or uh, sitting behind what I've talked about, in terms of really cultural and economic um, areas of strength which will encourage uh, greater economic development there as well. So I think there's a lot going on. I think there's more that could be done and that's what I'm looking forward to alongside the urban mobility stuff that we've already talked about. Um, very quickly, scalability of charge points. I had a big charge point round table the other day at the, at the um, where's the gentleman? I've lost him. There you go, thanks. Um, uh, at the Treasury on this and the overwhelming feedback from the players there was that actually the market was working quite well at the moment. Um, it needed more um, permissive uh, legislation of the kind that we're bringing in through the AEV bill uh, to support interoperability, but actually the next area of support was going to have, or of, of focus for government should be on resilience of network infrastructure, preparing for fast and uh, ultra-fast charging. So I thought it was very, very interesting feedback and it's something we're certainly thinking about. Let's not forget, we've, we're doing okay at the moment, but we could, certainly could do better. Um, final question, Science Museum, mm. public engagement. I absolutely love all that stuff. Of course, that's a bit of how to use the assets. Um, uh, I'd say one thing, which is um, the, the scientific, uh, one of the things I love about this country is how we can forget staggering amounts of our own heritage mm. when we're thinking about the future. I mean, you know, and of course, industrial heritage, technological heritage, you know, I mean, people go, uh, are happy to talk about um, Brunel, but how many people could tell you one thing that Thomas Telford, probably the single most successful um, engineer of the uh, 19th century, has done? Answer, virtually no one. And I think we could do much more in all those areas, as well as celebrating some of the more uh, uh, better known cutting edge science that we see today. Thank you. Do the panelists, other panelists want to comment? Yes. Uh, two points. First on engagement, um, so Helen's, Helen's point. Just to make the point that there are two types of engagement and, and both are important. The first one is the normal public engagement where you, you get uh, feedback or whatever. The second one is what I was talking about in co-design and co-creation, um, which is absolutely vital for future mobility services. So if I can give you a quick example, in the Navigogo package, mobility package of 16 to 25 year olds, rather than people like me trying to second guess what 16 or 25 year olds will want from their mobility, why don't you ask them? And that's just what they did. And one of the things they did late at night, one of the big issues they have is sharing a taxi fare. And, and there's always a big argument. So within the mobile app that they have, or the web app, of now, could you design a taxi sharing uh, function in that, which they've done. That's the kind of thing I'm talking about, which is two different, and we need them both. The second point is rural mobility, absolutely right. and and, and I think we need to define public transport in a much broader way. Quite often in rural areas, the, the double-decker bus or single-decker bus going around every hour or two hours, usually half empty or even empty, is not fit for purpose. It doesn't go where people want and, and it, it doesn't go at the right time. Um, so the bus will still be the workhorse of all of these things, of course. But if you bring in things like peer-to-peer -peer car share, uh, lift share, faxi, all of these shared mobility services that are coming in. I think if you bundled them, and there's a regulatory issue here for bus companies are quite constrained in what they can do at the minute. I think if you bundled all of that, 
in a fit for purpose. One, you would save operational costs, and there's a great example in Sydney of that, of bridge and uh, transit services. And secondly, you'd provide a much better service to the, to the people in terms of social equity as well. Right. Any quick comments here? Yeah. Um, just really on the the, uh, the electric charging side, I think uh, where we really want to get is, is, is developments in scale of people implementing electric vehicle fleets. And a couple of the areas where our, our members and their customers are really putting difficulties is one around sort of planning difficulties and just the number of hoops and the cost of getting charging infrastructure put in, um, which again, we hear back figures like, you know, sometimes if you're trying to plan an electric fleet, um, and how viable it is over the long term, it's sort of 20 to 30 percent of the overall cost, including the cost of the asset and the charging, can be spent on that. So, again, that's a really easy thing to put someone off. And the other area is, again, around the resilience of the local power grid, where we've had members who want to put in, you know, uh, 20, 30, 40 electric vans in a depot in the outskirts of a city, um, and they're being told they need to pay for an upgrade to the local. Um, grid uh, station, which can cost hundreds of thousands of pounds, and that is not an investment they're going to see any long-term value in. That's not going to be able to sit on their balance sheet. They can't take it with them when they go. So that's another area I think we need to look into. Right. Any quick comments? Um, yeah, just very quickly to um, to Helen. So. Um uh, yeah, we have actually been in touch with the Science Museum about the um, AV exhibition for next spring, so we're hoping we can take part in that. Um, I, I think just a point to make that in my industry, autonomous vehicles, um, public engagement I think is absolutely vital to um, actually to, to building that public trust and uh, acceptance of the technology. And there have been some, some early studies done in this space that show that actually um, uh, if you can help people to become more familiar with this technology through, for, for instance, giving them a, perhaps a short ride in an autonom autonomous vehicle, then actually their trust um, significantly increases and the, the amount of engagement you need to do for that is not, um, you know, that, that's not a long period of engagement. In some cases it's um, of the order of seconds where somebody can go from being very sceptical about this technology to actually um, feeling a lot, uh, they have much more trust in it. So it's definitely something that is extremely important for us and I think for the industry as a whole not to look as though we're developing uh, this technology in a, in, a, in a vacuum and under secrecy, but actually to, to be as transparent as possible and to enable people to become um, as familiar as possible with the technology as it starts to come to market. Right, thanks. Let's collect another set of interventions. Starting here, yes. Uh, Neil Cluffley, Managing Director of Faraday Aerospace. Um, I'm delighted to see the enthusiasm about aircraft. Um, we are currently probably one of the UK's leading hybrid aircraft development programs at the moment. Just come back from San Francisco talking about the future of regional mobility and such like. Um, to give you an idea, just two things I'd like to cover. One, I think it is essential that air is included in any discussion about mobility. That's absolutely vital. If it still takes four hours to get from Cardiff to the north of Wales via existing land transport, we've got to change that. It's 2018. We can do that. More importantly, numbers. Um, 250 million is a great number. Um, when compared to 100, million, 100 billion spent on HS2, it's a small number. If we put 200 companies into a 250 million pot, we're just over a million a company. Volocopter in Germany just got 90 million from Daimler Chrysler. The American companies, Wright Flyer, just got over 100 million for their projects. We have got to aim bigger. And if we're going to aim bigger, that means that we have also got to have a very, very clear understanding to the point that Lucy made about how do we get some of our companies in the UK stepping out to compete against these guys in Silicon Valley. Because what we just told them last week, everybody at the Uber, Co the Uber Elevate conference last week suddenly realized that this autonomous thing is going to take a while. All aircraft will have to be piloted. We've been going four years. We've been saying that for a long time. Our aircraft will be ready by 2020. I'd love to come and talk to you about it. Very good. Now, you to pass it along. I think there's, there's two more people in a row there. Yep. Uh, hi, uh, Robert McElveen from Royal Mail. Um, so a couple of questions. One, what about HGVs? We haven't really talked about those yet, and that's a huge challenge. Two, what can large buyers of vehicles do? We buy sort of four or 5,000 vehicles a year. We bought, recently bought our first 100 electric vehicles, of which our drivers are fighting over the right to drive them, so good, good progress. But how can you make it easier for us to buy more? Um, issues include sort of this, just the number coming, coming to market and the charging point, absolutely. It's, it's shaping a lot of where we're deploying rather than right. where the pollution problem is. Do you want to pass it behind you to the lady behind you? Yep. Victoria Merton from the Peel Group. We're private investors into eight ports and four airports into the UK. I want to ask a question about practical support for freight. In order to release congestion on the roads, we need to take containers off the roads. 
So our investment into the Port of Liverpool of £400 million will help release that congestion, but we need to get them out of the Port of Liverpool and moving around the country. So my question is about practical freight considerations for road and rail connectivity. Right, and then there's, yes, the gentleman there. And I'm going to move across. I think I'm going to try to make this the final round of questions because we've got a lot coming up. Yeah, sure, thank you. Uh, Andy Sellers from the Compound Semiconductor Applications Catapult. Um, so it was mentioned that electric vehicles are perhaps more, uh, more urgent than autonomous vehicles. Um, the UK currently manufactures 2.5 million uh, internal combustion engines and nine engine plants. We have the capability to create the entire supply chain for electric vehicles in the UK using uh, UK semiconductor fabs. So how do we actually encourage it and anchor that supply chain in the UK? Right. Thank you. Very good. Now, across here on this side, yes. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Nigel Clark, I'm the chairman of Ultra MTS. Those of you who've travelled on the Heathrow pod system, that's us. Um, I just wanted to ask a question about investment. Um, the DFT put, or Department of Transport as was, put 2.7 million into this 20 years ago. When I first invested, I went to a meeting at the DFT and the official looked at me and said, that is the worst 2.7 million we have ever spent. And I think we're about to prove them wrong, I hope. Although I have to say, rather like Sony Walkman, we're having to go to the Far East in order to demonstrate it. Britain's a complicated place for doing transport. And one of the reasons is that it's very hard to calculate returns on investment. Um, I think it's one of the things that's necessary here is to put economics into the calculation, mm -hmm. particularly land use. Why are people moving and who is benefiting is a fundamentally important question in actually deciding what's worth investing in and how to make it work. If you go to an, um, any American city, the mayor will tell you that he's in competition with every city within 50 miles to attract younger people to come and live and work yeah. there. And the urban environment is now a fundamental question. How does he get his local businesses to invest is the second question. And then behind you, gentlemen, yep. Thank you. Uh, Duncan Russell from Ocado Technology. Um, so uh, just adding on to the previous discussions about HGVs, uh, freight, um, in, in urban environments, and um, a lot of the movement is people going shopping or people having deliveries. So what about the, um, the lifeblood of a city, which is the food? Right. And now, any other interventions? Yes, the gentleman there. The first <coughs> one, and yes, and then Thank comes you. the front. I'm um, Philip yep. Danton, the chair of the Bicycle Association, representing the cycle industry. Um, it always seems to me at occasions like this that people are rather coy about bicycles. Um, fascinated, absolutely fascinated by cars, by electric cars, by autonomous cars, by aeroplanes. Uh, and there in front of us, um, rather sort of um, humbly sits um, the electric bicycle, the e-bike, the e-cargo bike, for urban transport, um, it doesn't have the footprint uh, of a car, um, it has the health benefits um, that cars don't offer, and it doesn't have the congestion problems that even electric cars are not going to solve. And I'm still puzzled by um, phrases from the Minister um, like, um, we're thinking about it. Uh -huh. mm. picture of the car. He, uh, let me say, Jesse came here by bike. You can't do better than that. It's living the message. Right. <laughs> Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, Rob Roy from the UK Defence Solutions Centre. First of all, Jesse, I live in a very remote valley in South Wales, so your comments on the internet, we'll have a discussion afterwards. But my question <laughs> is more around the data, and I think you're right. Looking at the exciting future, what is it we can do today for the UK um, government? Uh, we're moving a lot of stuff around cities uh, health authorities, councils, spend a lot of their time moving stuff around. They're under incredible budget pressure. What can we do to inspire and enable the leaders in the councils to do something smart with today's technology that will make a real difference? Right. This time around, I'm going to start with the panellists so that we give the minister the, the final word. So unless I... Is there someone I've missed out? No, I think we've got everything. Brilliant. Um, let me just add a couple of comments on my head. Because uh, there's some themes emerging. There is the uh, patient funding, patient mm. capital theme. Uh, there's the access to charging points. I would say another theme, which comes right back into Whitehall, is the smart cities agenda and the mobility agenda, which have tended to get into separate silos with separate flows of funding. Uh, but one of the things we're looking at, including wearing my hat is on the board of UKRI, is whether there shouldn't be more of a convergence and overlap between what we're doing on future cities, that's the catapult, for example, um, and what we're doing on transport and mobility. And it was interesting, although there is a rural issue, which, of course, the Minister is well aware of, 
a lot of the interventions are about pressures on, on cities, and perhaps that's an area where government could do more. And then a technology we haven't heard much about is batteries, but there's a lot of money going into batteries. Uh, and there's a bit of a tussle going on between the battery, innovative batteries for transport and innovative batteries for clean energy. And uh, one of the battles that you're finding already as we look at proposals for the Faraday Institute is the extent to which it is there to help with transport challenges and batteries for transportation and the extent to which it's there to help with energy challenges and the storage of uh, energy coming from renewable energy sources. And that's a good example of the kind of practical dilemmas governments have. You start off with a, with a general purpose initiative and try to balance different claims on it. So let's hear briefly from our panellists and then from the Minister. Let's start at the far end, David. Uh, thanks, David. Uh, just one other word that nobody mentioned but is cru crucial to what's happening is that's interoperability. We will not have the one model for every area. It'll be, it'll, you know, it's already happening. So they have to be like mobile phone roaming. You know, I don't want to ha have 50 mass accounts all over the UK. So that's the thing. Freight's interesting. The freight market, the freight mass market is bigger than the passenger market. It's huge. Um, and there's, there's an interesting crossover, isn't there? You know, with in Sweden, parcels getting delivered to your parked car and all this kind of stuff and home deliveries. I think that's a very interesting area that we need, we need to look at. And in fact, talking to some of the freight logistics people, they, they know how to do this. I mean, I wish I'd thought of it, but it wasn't me. But somebody once said, people are just self-loading freight. And, and you know, <laughs> co co freight, freight logistics are delivering uh, parcels door to door in a seamless way. They know how to do this. And they've got a whole series of back offices that know precisely how to do this, and they are looking at it as, as we speak. So that's going to be a really interesting area. Um, the second area is investment. We've got an issue here in that the normal model, is it a five-stage treasury model, or the, the normal model, how many jobs do you create, does it reduce CO2? We can't answer these questions at the minute because we haven't got the evidence. So we're in, a, we're in this loop and we can't get out of it. And the, the Netherlands government, in their uh, investment roadmap for mass, we use the word experimental stage. That's where we are. Government has got to release funding through the challenge funding and recognize that we don't know where this is going to go, yeah. but we need the evidence. And so that it's got to be that experimental stage. And you will not be able to say how many jobs at this stage. You can have a guess if you want. We're getting very tight for time. Now. And, and the, the, third, the third thing is, you know, the whole data sharing. You can either go the Finnish government way and say anybody operating in mobility have got to open up their APIs and their data to share, or you can try and incentivize companies. And that's a debate worth having as well. Right. Yep. Um, the only way I can really be qualified to comment on is the, is the HGV sector. Um, and I do feel for any HGV operator at the moment, I mean, they are really, um, there's no electric, short term, there's no electric solution. Um, so it's back to the dreaded D word. I think diesel in, in the sort of short to even sort of early medium term is the only real real solution but we've got this impending issue of air quality and clean air zones um, where you know asking a company like Royal Mail or others to really invest heavily into electric vehicles at a time when they're having to face really really rapid upgrades to their to their fleets just to cope with things like clean air zones where about 50% of the UK fleet's not going to be compliant when these clean air zones start coming in um, you're asking the impossible so I think that's an area that needs to be looked at. Thank you. Lucy? Um, yeah, just on, on the point on, on, um, on funding, autonomous driving in the, in the urban environment is a really challenging problem and um, uh, certainly the science is, is, is not there yet. Um, to build this kind of business and to build a real genuine competitor to the Silicon Valley companies and, and the big Chinese companies is going to take a lot of capital. Um, we did some analysis, we looked at um, corporate and venture funding of similar uh, to autonomous vehicle companies in the States and in China. Um, from the information that's publicly out there, we can see that in the States there's been about 5.5 billion US dollars of investment. In China it's about 1.5 billion and that's what we know about, that's what's visible publicly. Um, in, in, in Europe we can see that the analogous figure looks as though it's around 90 million US dollars. So it's significantly lower. So um, we think government definitely has a role to play there in, in helping to fill that gap. Maybe it's keystoning a mega venture fund. Um, it's probably 
probably also um, doing something which government is, is not in the habit of doing, which, but which is actually trying to identify, pick some winners at a fairly, uh, at a fairly early stage. The other point I wanted to talk about was <coughs> e-bikes. Um, the gentleman who raised that, um, you're right, bikes um, quite often get left out of these conversations. Um, I think um, they're really interesting to me. I think um, if, if we can deliver a, if, if we can deliver a, co a commercial model that looks like what we want it to look like, which is complementing public transport, it will also support more active travel. So it should also support more people walking, more people cycling. Um, and I think that ecosystem, it can all work together. There are some instances in which um, a bike is maybe not the default choice. For instance, if you've got heavy luggage or it's in inclement weather, uh, or you actually want to maybe do some work while you're moving. But I think there are other instances where actually, yeah, the bike or walking um, are, are great choices. And actually, it should be about designing a mobility system that incorporates all of those. Thank you very much. And the final word to Jesse. Thank you so much for joining us. Well, what an absolute pleasure. I've got 19 seconds left, um, <laughs> David. And having finished this opening sentence, I've got 15 seconds left. Um, um, so let me just say a couple of things. First of all, there's one excellent theme that's emerging, which, um, which is always um, something I notice in these events, which is the massive call for further government funding for a sector, which just happens to include the person who happens to be speaking. Um, and I, I've noticed it in air, and we've seen it with freight today, and we've seen it with um, uh, bikes and a whole various other things. And I'm entirely sympathetic. I understand that. I think that's a proper exercise of interest in um, a country that thrives on the discussion of the interests. But um, proper government isn't just made by listening to those guys. It's made by thinking about the general public policy implications. Um, let me just give a very quick example, um, and I'll just rebuff Philip gently back as I did, having had a private conversation with him uh, as the bike uh, uh, association about the conversations we're having about bicycles at the moment. Um, uh, it, you could think that all bicycles are the same, but they're not all the same. Right, so e-bikes have very strong effects on uh, encouraging people to, to um, travel that they wouldn't do otherwise. They go further on e-bikes um, uh, because they take more journeys than they would otherwise. Um, it's very good for people with disabilities. It's very good for people who are older. But that bike, that, but that market. And by the way, I believe bicycles be an absolutely intrinsic part of transport policy, and uh, very obviously so. Um, but let me say one other thing, which is um, e-bikes. Um, that market's working rather well. Now, the e-cargo bikes are a different thing. E-cargo bikes are a potential replacement for um, often quite heavily polluting local white vans. That's a different kind of market. If we jump them up, if we pretend they're the same, we can't make intelligent government decisions. We're trying to do that. I've outlined a whole range of measures today, which we can. Um, uh, just it, to abuse the challenge of another second or two, let me say a couple mm. of things. Um, uh, we've had some very good comments today. I absolutely think that our... Uh, a proper strategy is going to make these kinds of intelligent trade-offs between different markets. It's going to be very inclusive in recognizing substitutions between markets. That's why air is so important, as was raised here, because there are substitutions in freight delivery and passenger transport um, that uh, will get missed out of the picture if you don't include them. Um, and of course, there's an issue not just of structure and regulation, but of moral uh, and personal energy. And the point was absolutely rightly raised about how we're going to inspire local authorities. Mm -hmm. Um, well, there's a very simple way to inspire people, and this is, occurs in business, whereby, I might add, the vast majority of investment will occur, and which we do not want to crowd out through public investment, we want to crowd in if possible, um, which is uh, by giving people responsibility and authority. And I, I draw your attention to the effect that we're already seeing in transport through the creation of metro mayoralties under this and the previous government, where you know, the Andy Burnhams, the Andy Streets, um, uh, the Ben Houghtons of this world are out there trying to make very visible difference to transport in their areas. And the reason is because they know they're on the hook, they know they can make a difference, and they want to get everyone together in an area. And I absolutely salute that. I'm going to shut up because we're two minutes past. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much. Thank you, David. Good. We're grateful to the minister. We're grateful to our panel. And above all, thank you to the, all the guests here who brought your expertise to bear. Thanks very much. <laughs>